Hey guys, this is Doug with Fellowship of the Martyrs and the Church of Liberty. Um, call, I'm uh, doing a video to respond to an email. Um, so, But I'm not going to put this under uh, Doug Answers Martyr Mail because this is more a structural thing and I think it'll have a benefit to lots of folks. So, here's the email. Hi, Brother Doug. Um, sorry to bother you, sir. Uh, wish you wouldn't do that. But I have been researching the internet for the past four days, and I just can't seem to find anything that answers the questions that I have as far as setting up a new church as a non-registered church. I have just watched your YouTube video entitled, What is a 501c3? All churches are 501c3s. I perfectly understand how all churches fall under IRS code 501c3, and that a church needs to decide whether they're going to incorporate and receive special recognition of tax-exempt status, or whether they are not going to seek that special recognition. I would like to start a church that chooses not to seek that special recognition. I have decided that I will form my church by creating a formation affidavit that I will have notarized, but how do I set up my PayPal and bank accounts as a nonprofit without receiving that special recognition? Any information that you care to share with me regarding the financial setup of my ministry would be greatly appreciated. Okay, that's from Bill. Um, okay. Now, uh, I'm going to take a step back, Bill, because I'd like this video to be as thorough as possible for people that haven't done as much research as you've already done. Okay. Now, uh, so let's start with every church is a 501c3 because... Section 501c3 of the IRS code is the section of the code that talks about churches. Now, what people typically mean when they get all stressed and say, is your church a 501c3? What they mean is, have you formed a corporation with a board of directors that has requested special permission to be considered a church under Section 501c3? And uh, it's a thousand dollars or so application fee, and it might take up to a year. And uh, you show your charitable purpose. You have to file all kinds of stuff. Anybody can request a form nine ninety, uh, where you have to show your major donors and and who's getting paid how much and all that kind of stuff. And every year you've got to go back to the IRS and prove to them that you're still being charitable. Because you're a business, okay, that you're, you're structured like a business, you're a corporation that has requested permission to be considered a church. Or you can just say, we're a church, that's it, leave us alone. You don't even have to tell them anything. You don't have to report anything, you just open the doors and be a church. You can automatically, you are automatically tax exempt, you're automatically able to give deduction uh, letters to people that donate. Uh, constitutionally, you're good to go. Let me read you from publication 1828. I'll put a link in the description. Um, here it says, uh, um, okay, this is on page three of the IRS publication 1828. Churches that meet the requirements of IRS, uh, uh, IRC, uh, let me, let me, I got to blow that up without my glasses on here. Okay. Um, recognition of tax exempt status, automatic exemption for churches. Churches that meet the requirements of IRC section 501c3 are automatically considered tax exempt and are not required to apply for and obtain recognition of tax exempt status from the IRS. Although there is no requirement to do so, many churches seek recognition of tax exempt status from the IRS because such recognition assures church leaders members and contributors, that the church is recognized as exempt and qualifies for related tax benefits. For example, contributors to a church that has been recognized as tax exempt would know that their contributions generally are tax deductible. Okay, this is, this is where they get you. If I say I'm a church, I can, I'm automatically tax deductible, donations are automatically tax deductible, but I'm not in the list that the IRS keeps of, of who is publicly 
tax deductible and has been checked out by the IRS, has, has filed their paperwork, and the IRS has certified as tax deductible. So if somebody, if somebody goes to the, uh, the IRS website and says, okay, on the list of public charities and churches, uh, does the Church of Liberty show up? No, it doesn't show up because we didn't ask them to verify that we're tax deductible. Now, that can come into play if you're requesting donations from large foundations or uh, some organization that wants to see you on that list and doesn't understand that all you have to do is say, I'm a church, and you're automatically tax deductible. Um, the, the, the courts have struggled with this ever since 1950 when churches um, became tax deductible. And um, there is another document here. It's, an, it's in the IRS uh, website. Uh, I'm going to link to. It says, in applying the analysis to determine whether a religious organization may properly be characterized as a church, uh, the Internal Revenue Service considers whether the organization has the following characteristics. Okay, there's basically 15 criteria that they're going to look to. There's no real, like, you have to meet seven or eight of the 15 or whatever, and they're pretty loosely defined because constitutionally they fairly have to leave churches alone. But these are basically what they're looking for. Now, in response to Bill, if you are starting a food pantry, none of this applies to you. You need to be a corporation and request permission to be a 501c3 charity. Or you're doing so so little dollars that you that you're under about five thousand a year, and you don't need to you don't need to bother. For example, a youth softball club would be a non-registered, non-profit organization if they did less than five thousand dollars a year in total money coming through the organization. The IRS is like, don't even bother registering with us. If you're charitable, educational purpose, and you're itty bitty, you don't have to register. Okay. Now, if you are an orphanage, if you are a, a community outreach of some sort, a service kind of project, if you're a food pantry, if you're a thrift store, if whatever, you will not meet the criteria for a church. Um, now, if you are a church that does those things, that's a different deal. Okay, but I'm going to read you these criteria, but this is what they're going to look for. So Bill didn't say, he used the word ministry, not specifically church. And so I don't know what he's trying to start and whether it meets any of these criteria or not. Um, okay, uh, this is uh, from page two of this, this other document. Excuse me. In applying the analysis to determine whether a religious organization may be properly characterized as a church, the IRS considers whether the organization has the following characteristics. A distinct legal presence. We'll talk about that in a minute. A recognized creed and form of worship. That could just be, you know, stylistically something about you that's different or whatever. That every day when we get together, we pray, we sing a song, we teach, you know, or whatever. A definite and distinct ecclesiastical government. That means somebody's in charge. Uh, some board, some individual, some however you're structured, that there's some recognizable uh, church government. A formal code of doctrine and discipline. That could be as simple as one piece of paper that says, uh, if, if anything goes wrong, we're going to pray about it and ask the Lord what to do. That's still a formal code. Uh, a distinct religious history. Okay, pretty much you're automatically going to have that. If you've existed for any amount of time at all, you're going to develop your own you know, here's the people that started it, and we grew from a home into a building, and now we meet in a warehouse or whatever. Uh, uh, number six, a membership not associated with other churches or denominations. Okay, that can be a little tricky um, in that you have to have members, which some people don't even have a real membership. We don't have a membership exactly, although the people that are here may go somewhere else on Sunday morning but they consider themselves part of this more than anything else. An organization of ordained ministers. Okay, any church, whether it's the Church of Rainbows and Unicorns or whatever, can ordain ministers by whatever criteria they decide to do those, which is 
ordained ministers selected after completing prescribed studies. Um, a literature of its own, established places of worship, uh, 11 regular congregations, regular religious services, Sunday schools for religious instruction of the young. Okay, that doesn't mean Sunday. You could be Seventh-day Adventists and have Saturday schools, but they use the word Sunday school to reference training for youth uh, rather than the day of the week that it meets. Schools for the preparation of its ministers and other facts and circumstances that may bear upon the organization's claim for church status. Okay, Some people, they'll want to see a bulletin, like I can't dummy that up in 10 seconds. Um, but some organizations aren't going to have a church bulletin. Uh, they would have regular services once a quarter or um, twice a week or Saturdays and Sunday morning or whatever. Um, your process for ordaining ministers could be very complex, years and years of, of study in a monastery or, you know, um, fairly straightforward and simple. Um, so th there's a lot of leeway in how they define these things. The main thing is that you that you look like these are these are what the court has kind of decided um, basically fits the, the, the what we describe a, a church as as opposed to uh, an orphanage or some other charitable organization. Uh, churches are specifically different than some other kind of ministry. Okay, so <laughs> let me get back to the email here. Um, okay. Uh, now, as far as his specific question was, what do I do about PayPal and bank accounts and stuff like that? Now, people freak out and think that when you're a corporation that has requested special permission to be under Section 501c3, that the IRS then has control over all of your speech. And that is a complete lie. Okay. Section 501c3 of the IRS Code, and you'll read it in Publication 1828, specifically says what churches are not supposed to do, whether they're unregistered churches or a corporation that has requested special permission. And mainly it has to do with not endorsing political candidates, uh, not letting them from the pulpit be promoted as the candidate for this church. Um, now, that could extend... Uh, in the future to to where pastors aren't supposed to speak against a major political issue like Obamacare or uh, abortion or homosexuality or something else. Um, but the idea that speech is controlled more for the corporation than for the unregistered church is not true. They are all lumped under Section 501c3. And the controls over one apply to the other just as much. Okay, now the only threat the IRS has is to take away your tax-exempt status. And whether you are a corporation that has requested permission to be a church or an unregistered church, either way, they can still do that um, under Section 501c3. The main difference, okay, for, for us, the, the, the main reason for us is not worrying about speech. I'm going to say whatever I'm going to say. I don't care what penalties you bring. The vast majority of people that donate to the ministry don't ask for a tax receipt or are from some other country where it wouldn't make any difference if the U.S. government gave you a tax credit or not. So for us, you know, it, 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 I don't, it, whatever. Um, and potentially saving sales tax on purchases for the church is not something we've ever really pursued. And so that really doesn't matter either. Where it would mostly affect us is in donations for uh, groceries uh, for the food pantry and stuff like that. Where the grocery stores, they do they do want to see some, some tax credit coming back for their donations. Some of them, some of them don't. Some of them we don't sign anything. They don't, they don't. They don't have time to weigh out all the bananas. You know, it's going in the trash anyway. Just take it. But I, I would, I could see where that would have an effect. Uh, but on cash donations from people, hardly ever, unless it was a huge donation, would anybody even ask for a tax receipt. Uh, donations to the thrift store, it would affect to some degree. Uh, having to charge sales tax at the thrift store, it would to some degree. But um, 
it's not gonna it's not gonna keep my mouth shut if the Lord says to speak, and I would suspect that most others it wouldn't either. So the whole idea now the the main reason why big mostly big churches get convinced by their accountants and their lawyers to form corporations is because if someone were to slip and fall in the hallway and god forbid they they snap their spine and they're quadriplegic they're going to the insurance that you have for the church which you sh should have to have um, if you're renting a building or whatever we're required whether we like it or not to have insurance covering the landlord in case of fire and all this other stuff, accident and whatever. Anyway, they're going to go after the insurance. Say the insurance covers a million dollars and this is a $2 million injury. Okay, if you are an unregistered church with a board uh, and it's just kind of uh, the pastor and a couple of deacons or a pastor and a treasurer and a secretary or associate pastor or whatever, then they're going to come after you personally. And they're going to come after your house, your car, your assets to to come after the extra million dollars for this slip and fall that the insurance wouldn't pay. When you form a corporation, that corporation becomes a person. And uh, then the board of directors are independent of that. So if they file against the corporation, then they can attach to the assets of the corporation, take the building, take the bus, take whatever you got, to get that extra million dollars, but they're not coming after the houses and the personal assets of the business leaders or whoever that are on the, the board of uh, the organization. And that that's whether you were a for-profit or a not-for-profit, it works the same thing. When you create, when, when I had my furniture store, it was a subchapter S corporation. And, and the benefit of that is that it signs checks, that it's liable for stuff, and that if something happens, then basically they have to come after it and uh, if it runs out of money, then you just close it and start a new one, and uh, you get to keep your stuff. Unless you have a vendor that wants your personal signature on top of the corporation's signature for assets and stuff. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I don't think, um, I, I think a, a good lawyer... And I've talked to a lot of good nonprofit lawyers that shocked me when I said, look, we want to do this and without being a 501c3. He said, you're already a 501c3. What do you mean? I don't want to be. You already are. No, I'm not. I haven't. No, you are because you're in Section 501c3 by, by simply being a church. You are covered under Section 501c3. It's unavoidable. You're a 501c3. Oh, man. But I wasn't. Okay, but we're not a corporation that's requested special permission. Okay. I don't think it trusts God enough. To me, it's it's about the same as as having guards with guns in the prayer room at IHOP. I think it's a if 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 you trust God, then let the angels guard the doors, let the angels protect you from a slip and fall, and um, you know it's not none of it's your stuff anyway, whether personally or collectively. So to to look to the law to defend your stuff feels wrong to me. Now, uh, do I think that a corporation that does that is going to have their speech controlled more or less than us? No, it's the same code, okay? Either way, and the government's going to impose it on everybody when they want to shut everybody up regardless. It, there's no protection by being an unregistered church as far as speech is concerned. I, I don't think you can read that into the code anywhere that somehow we're exempt because we're not a corporation. Now, I also don't like the idea of having to do lots and lots of paperwork and keep track for the IRS of who my major donors are, of who's supporting the ministry, uh, where all the money's going, and all that kind of stuff. I would rather them just keep their hands off the church altogether. And if I am one who believes that uh, the government is going to turn against Christians and persecute Christians, then I would like as little information uh, about who my friends are to the government as possible. So um, we try not to even keep uh, records uh, of, of much of any kind. So, um, and if the government said, oh, you need to prove, you know, all of this and this and this and this, I'm like, no, you need to prove that I did it wrong, 
not I need to prove my innocence. You need to prove my guilt. And I dare you uh, in to, to, to find uh, enough receipts to do it. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> okay, so, uh, the bare minimum that you're going to need to open a bank account is a tax ID number. Now, a federal tax ID number it doesn't obligate you to anything. Um, it is simply a number by which the government knows you. Now, okay, it's dehumanizing, and blah, 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 blah. but uh, it doesn't cost anything, it doesn't obligate you to anything, and it doesn't control you in any way to have a federal tax ID number, an employer ID number. And it doesn't mean you have employees, it, it simply is uh, your tax number for that organization. So, uh, what you do is you uh, file, you, you write up the Articles of Association. It's not Articles of Incorporation because you're not incorporating. It's Articles of Association. You say, we are a free body, and we want to get together for these purposes, and we want to do these things. We want to be known as the Church of Liberty, and our intent is uh, educational and charitable and religious, and we are a church, and... Um, this is the day that we started, and uh, this is what we're going to do. And refer to the bylaws for more information. Okay, then you have a set of bylaws, which can be real simple. It can be a page or two. But it basically says this is how often we're going to meet. Uh, these, these are kind of going to be the leaders. You need at least three or five people to say, you know, this is the, the president, the secretary, the treasurer, or whatever names you want to give, but it doesn't really matter. But then we're going to meet once a year and review the bylaws and make sure that everything's okay. The bylaws can be changed by this process or two out of three vote or um, however you're going to write the bylaws. There's lots of examples of bylaws online and articles of association that you can just modify to fit what you need. And I would encourage you to make them just as generic and just as leave you as much freedom as possible because whatever they are, they're going to expect that you're honoring your bylaws. So if you put something in there that you have no intention of doing, don't do it. It's not honest. It's it's not, you know, you, you got a loophole there where there's a problem. So um, anyway, our articles of association, uh, those need to be notarized and with two, two people, two signatures and notarized. And then um, uh, now, okay, let me again, I guess I'll put a disclaimer at the front, but I'm not a lawyer. I've been through this a lot. I've, I've studied a lot of this stuff. I've talked to lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm telling you what we did, what we've been led to do, what I think will work in most every state that you're going to deal with. But uh, if you have any question at all, then you need to talk to a lawyer that understands nonprofit law and can advise you better. Okay. The article of association will be notarized. The bylaws don't need to be notarized because they can change any time. Uh, anytime you have a meeting, you can vote on a change to the bylaws. Churches do it all the time. You can have great big Robert's Rules of Order meetings and fight about it like some of the conventions do and whatever. Or it can just be a couple of real simple pages that say, you know, we're going to pray about it and do whatever God tells us. That could be your bylaws. Um, but you got to have bylaws. Um and they ought to cover things like, how, you know, who's in charge and how are we going to replace who's in charge and what do we do with our stuff if something should happen. Um, okay, now, for years, we resisted, didn't didn't get, okay, if you have those, those two things, your articles of association, your bylaws, you go on the irs.gov uh, website and you can do it online or you can do it over the phone and register you go through the little buttons, it asks you what kind of business you are, you say, I'm a church. And it will assign you a federal employer ID number, an FEIN. And uh, your FEIN becomes the identifier for your business, according to the government. And if you have employees, which I'd recommend you didn't, um, then uh, your workman's comp and all of that stuff is keyed to your employer ID number. Uh, again, that doesn't mean you're a corporation. Uh, whether you're Joe's Plumbing, you still have to have an employer, uh, a federal employer ID number. 
um, if you're going to hire contractors, if you're going to have employees, just to designate you on your bank account, that it's basically a social security number for the business to register you with the government, uh, as far as that goes. And you can argue about social security numbers and capital letter, okay, but... Either, either way, it's free and it doesn't obligate me in any way. There's no contract that I sign to get a federal employer ID number. It's just a identifier for their for their benefit, but it's required by the bank. So you take your articles of association, you take your uh, bylaws, you take your federal ID number, you go to the bank, and they'll open an account for you. Okay, uh, same with PayPal. Um you're going to have trouble with PayPal. We've had trouble with PayPal. If you're not a corporation with a 501c3 certificate, um, and in our experience, it's easier to just file with PayPal. Well, you can call them when you set it up. There's one where you're a nonprofit, and... Um, you have to show them they, they can't get their head around unregistered church. Um, and then there's one where you're a religious organization and you can accept donations that way, but you don't get the better price break from uh, PayPal on the donations because you haven't proven all of this stuff that they want to see. Okay. But at $3,000 a month, you get a better break anyway, and at ten thousand dollars a month of, of donations, you get the break you would have got over here anyway if you showed them the right paperwork. And uh, uh, anyway, so it, it's a matter of a half of a percent of what you pay on the PayPal donations or something. So it's not that big a deal, and it's not worth fighting over. And uh, we we got. A couple of times they're like, hey, you need to prove your whatever. So we did. And then they're like, no, that's not what we want. And we went around again. In the meantime, they lock up our account when there's money in there and we need it. And finally sorted it out uh, about a year ago. And, and we got into some category over here where we're a faith-based, religious, whatever, that can accept donations. But we're not getting their preferred price break because they've proven that we're a nonprofit or whatever. Because they, they, they just can't seem to get their head around no matter how much I've tried and tried with them. Um, so I would talk to them about that when you set up your PayPal account and just do it over the phone instead of doing it, um, on the internet, but that should be everything that you need to open, open a PayPal account and have it available. Um, that pretty much does it. I'm reading over his thing here, a formation affidavit, um, would work as an Articles of Association. Um, but typically what people are going to ask for is an Articles of Association. So I would just go ahead and name it Articles of Association at the top and then say we were formed on such and such a date and this is what we're for and this is what we're going to do and and have two signatures on it, even if it's you and your wife or you and whoever's uh, helping do this and have that notarized. And that would you're, you're on the right track there. I think what you're also going to need is some bylaws and um, they're typically going to want to have that on file somewhere to know that you're you have a, a procedure of how to operate in place. Um, but then the only other thing you need is the federal employer ID number. Now, if you, uh, like I said, we resisted for a long time filing with the state for sales tax exemptions. Uh, I didn't I didn't make an effort when we bought toilet paper. For the, for the houses, I just went to the grocery store and bought toilet paper. I didn't try to get out of saving 7% on sales tax, um, although legitimately we could. Um, until we opened the thrift store, it never really came up. Um, when we opened the thrift store, the city said, you need to file this sales tax exemption thing with the state. Or you need to be collecting sales tax on purchases and giving us our share. And I said, we're a church. We're tax exempt. They said, no, that's for donations that are given to you. You can you can give them a tax credit. That's not for state sales tax. That's a federal IRS thing. 
not state. Uh, so I went around and around a little bit. I went down to the State Department uh, building downtown Kansas City, and I talked to them a little bit, and they said, well, you need to be a Missouri corporation to avoid sales tax. I'm like, I don't want to be a corporation. They said, it's not really a corporation. It's the, We don't have any other category to put it under. So whether you're a sole proprietorship, an LLC, uh, a subchapter S, a subchapter C, a, a C Corp, or a church, we just call them corporations <laughs> because it's a business entity. I'm like, but I'm not a business. You're an entity, okay? We just want your entity to let the state know who you are so that we can figure out why we didn't get our sales tax. I'm like, okay, so what am I obligated to? I mean, I was down there for hours talking to whoever would talk to me. I said, what am I, what am I obligating myself to by forming a Missouri corporation? She says, you fill out this form, you list you and two other board members that you're going to meet once a year, and you're going to update your records once a year, and you pay 20 bucks for us to file it. And then you don't have to pay sales tax on your purchases. We'll give you the little sales tax certificate that you can go to Sam's Club, and you don't have to pay for sales tax on toilet paper. But more importantly... People at your thrift store don't have to pay sales tax to you, and you don't have to report it back and pay it back to the state. Okay, so I said, "Does this is there any other obligation in here uh, to me in this?" No, no. Okay, so if so, <laughs> it gets a little complicated, and and Bill, if you don't need it, then don't do it. Um. But there's no way around it in in our case, and I can't find a downside to to doing a Missouri request for uh, exemption from sales tax. All you do is say I'm a church, and they say okay. They don't ask you to for a bulletin or show us prove anything to us. They just say okay. So you say I'm a church. And uh, this is what we're doing for the purposes of our thrift store, for purchases for our homeless shelter. This is how much we expect it could add up to. Uh, the first year was just a guess. I have no idea. And they, they approve it. And they send you a certificate. And then uh, stuff that you buy for the ministry, you don't have to pay sales tax on copy, copy machines or, or whatever. Um... Uh, it makes a difference also with vehicles. Uh, I can give them that. And then, um, you know, if I did purchase um, something that needed to be titled, like a, a truck, I don't have to pay sales tax on that. So that could add up uh, pretty good. A lot of vehicles we have are just gifted to us, and uh, so we don't have sales tax there anyway. But if we did buy it, then I'm, I'm ex we're exempt from the sales tax on it if, it, if, the, if it's titled to the church. Um, now your state may be different. I suspect not. I suspect uh, state sales tax. You're going to run into the same thing. Maybe they'll, maybe they won't call it a corporation. Maybe they'll have one that just says church on it. But our certificate says a Missouri corporation, the church of Liberty. Um, uh, but it doesn't obligate us in any of the ways. Uh, and it, it is completely separate than federal IRS section 501c3. That's, that's federal code. The state code doesn't have any, um, uh, any anywhere where it says what churches can and can't do or say, uh, or limit speech in any way that I can find anywhere, um, or even a department for licensing or whatever. When you go to marry somebody, it says on the on the marriage license, "Are you in good standing with your denomination and able to do marriages?" And you either sign yes or you don't do it. I guess. Uh, but there's no department. You, you, it's not like you can call and say, can you give me a list of authorized, licensed pastors in Missouri? There's no such department. They, they have their hands off of all of that. Uh, and any local congregation can ordain or license, um, which two two separate things. But 
uh, I was licensed into the ministry by Second Baptist Church in Liberty when I was 18 years old and was able to do weddings and funerals and stuff like that. Uh, although you're probably not going to be a pastor until you're ordained and go to, go to seminary and whatever they require from you. But depending on how big the denomination is or, or um, you know, uh, they may have lay leaders uh, that are pastors. They may not. They may be Quakers that don't have any pastors at all. So the Quakers, for example, uh, do you have seminaries for training of no? Do you have ordain no? Do you uh, do you have a rules about how to ordain them no? Do you have ecclesiastical government not really? Um, but do you have regular meetings yes? Do you have Sunday school for the kids yes? Do you you know? So it, it they mainly are going to look and see if you're making a good faith effort to be a church as far as you define church, and they can kind of look at it and say, yeah, that's a church. If it's just mom and dad around a dining room table, nah, that's, uh, publication 8228 goes around, like some of the court cases where people have lost because they weren't really a church, it was just a tax dodge, and uh, that'll come back and bite you. So, uh, anyway, the, 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 main, the main warning that I would give you is don't try to do this if you're a ministry that doesn't look anything like a church. If, if, you, if you are having regular meetings, if you have a, a, a sort of a congregation, if you have, uh, you know, some of the basic structure, even if it's in homes, even if it's irregular or whatever, fine. But if you are doing something completely different where it's just you, you want tax-exempt status for your radio show, uh, you better be careful. If you want tax exemption for your orphanage, your food pantry, um and that's all you do, you, you really need to just go ahead, file, be a 501c3 corporation, and request special permission uh, because you, you, you don't fit under the church criteria to get out of all of that. Um, anyway, again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm giving you the best I got, um, but check with somebody else. If you doubt me, do your own kind of research. I'll put some links down here to the publications I referenced. Um, oh, the other the other main thing where you could really get in trouble is if you switch. Um, there, if you want to do some research on Indianapolis Baptist Temple, back about ten or fifteen years ago, I guess it was, they were a five hundred one c three corporation that decided they wanted to go, to be an unregistered church, and. So they dissolved the corporation, reformed as an unregistered church, hired all the employees as independent contractors, and paid the 15% of FICA. Normally when you have a contractor, um, you pay 7.5%. When you have an employee, they pay 7.5%, you pay 7.5% of their FICA. When they're independent contractors, they're responsible for the whole 15%. So what what uh, Indianapolis Baptist Temple did was they had the employees pay their seven and a half percent as contractors, and then the, the they they overpaid them seven and a half percent so that it would cover so that they all didn't get a, a pay cut because the structure changed of the church. Uh, after several years, the IRS said we don't like this. We expect you to be paying this. They said, but it's been getting paid by the employees themselves. They said, we don't care. We still recognize you as who you were. You have employees. These are employees. They look like employees, smell like employees. You should be paying them. And you owe us so many million dollars in back FICA that wasn't paid. And they said, but it was paid. You have the money. The employees paid it. They said, we don't care. We're seizing your building. And they did. Threw them out on the street. Um, that mainly... Um, I don't know how that could have been avoided, except, you know, if you're an unregistered church and you want to go toward the government, they're not going to fuss. If you're a, a corporation that wants to unincorporate and be an unregistered church, you could open yourself up to all kinds of mess. And it's worth studying the case study of the Indianapolis Baptist Temple and looking at what happened there and uh, what lessons can be learned from that. I would encourage you to given Obamacare, given EEOC laws, given uh, people suing because you're not hiring transsexuals to be the secretary of your church or whatever, 
I would encourage you to not have employees, if at all possible. Uh, my dad was a pastor. As long as I can remember growing up, uh, he was an independent contractor, uh, which works okay because as a pastor, you don't know, you don't, you're not taxable for praying and preaching. So you have no tax liability except on fees that you charge for baptisms, weddings, and funerals, or any other fee if you're doing counseling or something like that. But uh, for salary, you can't be taxed for preaching and praying. And so as an independent contractor, he would owe the whole 15% of FICA, but then again, none of his income is taxable, so it doesn't matter. And then he could get a housing allowance for a parsonage and, and a vehicle allowance and whatever on top of that that would also not be taxable for him to go do his job. Um, anyway, um, so I would encourage you to, uh, as much as possible, just stay out of the whole employee employer relationship, if at all possible. Um, there are specific rules about that, about who can be an independent contractor, who can't. If you tell them when to show up at work, how to work, how to do their job, whatever, and uh, they clock in and clock out and look like an employee, the IRS is going to consider they're, they're an employee, whether you call them an independent contractor or not. If you're Domino's, they're driving their own car, uh, you have some flexibility as far as what shifts they work, and they basically are requesting uh, work, um, and you hire as needed, um, and it looks more like a contractor relationship, then you can get away with that, and you're not going to be subject to, um, to a lot of the uh, um, OSHA, EEOC, ADA, you know, whatever stuff. Um, anyway, again, uh, once you get into that stuff, talk to an attorney. And make sure that they're somebody that knows the gospel and knows the law and can try to somehow get them to fit. Anyway, I know this is long, but I'm trying to give you as thorough as possible a, a structure. If you want more information, if you need to give me a call, uh, my information is down in the description. Send me an email. We'll do whatever we can. We have several congregations here in Kansas City and people around the country that have called us to help them set up their new ministries and set up their 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 churches um, without in in the unregistered church kind of a way and uh, be operational without getting the IRS up in their business and we're glad to help as many as possible now I still am committed to City Church and I would encourage you if you're starting a new church to read my book uh, Do It Yourself City Church Restoration. And consider whether what you're doing is a biblical church at all or not. And um, we are the Church of Liberty. We are not the only church in Liberty. Uh, we are part of the Church of Liberty, just like Church of Ephesus, Church of Smyrna, Church of Laodicea. And we know that there are members of the Church of Liberty all over town, many of whom we haven't met, that love Jesus, that are in the Book of Life, and that we are one with, whether they want to be one with us or not. And our assets, our resources belong to the body of Christ in liberty and uh, are available for their use as, uh, as much as possible. That's the way it ought to work. There ought to be one body per city under Christ. I can't find any other biblical model. So uh, if you are going to use all of this information to set up a factious, sectarian denomination of your own, uh, you're welcome to do that, but I encourage you um, to uh, really swallow hard and think about what Christ is calling us to be one, how that ought to manifest, and whether um, just because you have a bank account means that you're not one <laughs> with the other Christians in your city. Uh, hopefully, if you hang around this channel very long, you'll start to have some of the stick to you and start to get the idea that the Messiah that we say we love, that prayed that we would be one, as he and the Father are one, we, we probably ought to honor that last prayer before going to the cross above everything else. So, 
even if you have a discreet legal presence, even if you have a budget and God is calling you to do a specific thing, I want you to keep in your head that you're one. If they got in the book of life, you're one with them, whether you like it or not. And you better get used to it. You're going to spend eternity with them. You better start playing nice with them now. Not dividing over stupid stuff like what version of the Bible you're reading or whether you use instruments in worship or whether you take communion with grape juice or wine or whatever other fool thing, Saturday, Sunday, Peter, not Paul, pre, mid, post, whatever. None of those are allowable exemptions. Not language, not race, not anything. Um, the only justifiable reason to divide the body of Christ is that I'm the Church of Liberty, Missouri. You're the Church of Boston. You're the Church of you know, Phoenix, and we can't all be in the same place. And we long for and cry out for the Church of the New Jerusalem, where we can all be one, and, and there will be one church under Christ, uh, all together in one place. Anyway, that's it for now. Uh, contact us if you need more. God bless you. Thanks for listening. In the name of Jesus, amen.